Good morning and welcome to everybody that's out there looking at this um, expert briefing today on measuring and managing customer profitability with um, our friend, expert and author, Gary Kokins. Welcome, Gary. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for having me again. You know, before we, uh, before we get into this topic, you have tons of experience. You've been in this business quite a few years, um, lots of years, I think close to 40, if I recall. And, you know, with that kind of a career, and I know your background's really rich, it'd be great to give our audience a little bit of who's Gary Kokins. Well, my career has really been what I call in three thirds. Well, first I started with uh, industrial engineering operations research degree from Cornell University in 1971. So now you know my age. And I did my MBA at uh, Northwestern University's Kellogg. Um, the first third of my career was in industry. I was a division financial controller and operations manager for a Fortune 100 uh, manufacturer division. Middle 15 years was consulting, Deloitte, uh, KPMG, and then Electronic Data Systems, which is part of uh, uh, HP now. And then up until three years ago when I retired, I was with SAS for 16 years. And SAS, many of you are aware, is the uh, analytics uh, 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 software vendor. Um, I primarily because I wound up writing these books and articles that was in, I would say, business development roles, but it was really more, I think, educating and inspiring and my belief is look the technology supports the method so the software is not really the issue the software can do just about anything people need to understand methods and that's what we'll be talking about during this webinar well and with that background you've seen a lot of companies struggle with or try to manage their relationship with their customers so in some senses you you've got a phenomenal background to talk to us today about this subject but but Notwithstanding, why should companies be interested in, in kind of this whole area of measuring and then managing customer profitability? Well, my belief is that customers are the source of value creation for shareholders. And that's part of what this talk is going to be, because many companies don't really connect their information systems about customer behavior with shareholder wealth creation. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. Um, I think the real issue is that increasingly customers view suppliers as commodities. Um, you know, banks all have the same type of checking accounts and depository accounts. And the point is this, um, if, if customers are viewing a supplier as a commodity, then what suppliers need to do to be competitive is provide differentiated services to different segments or micro segments or even individual customers. And um, they're not all doing that well or those who are doing it, it's not really being measured. Um, there's some other complications here. Um, the incentive system for the sales force from a supplier has been pretty much, you know, grow market share and grow sales. And when we talk about what I'll describe here, it's the, guy, the language has got to be grow profitable sales because they're going to start discovering if they were using more progressive management accounting methods. And we will talk about activity-based costing and there's a whole issue, does it work or what happened to it in the 90s? It works and it's foundational. Um, that's gonna be required to basically calculate the individual profit and loss statements by customer. So if you're gonna, if we're gonna measure this and report on it, um, you know, what's it take to kind of calculate customer profitability? Because in my experience, this is not an easy thing. It's involved lots of places in the org, lots of pieces of information, lots of processes in the organization. So can you provide kind of us with a holistic kind of sense of what this actually takes to create one of these systems? Yeah. Well, part of the problem is what you just said. It said your experience is that it's complicated and that's part of the problem. It was made complicated in the 1990s uh, consultants and accountants were over designing these models, these their costing models way beyond diminishing returns on extra accuracy for the extra level of effort of work, 3000 activities, they wanted people to fill out timesheets every day, and of course employees hate timesheets, uh, IT would get involved and I, I could go on and on and the pro point is, you can basically get an ABC system up in three or four weeks using it, rapid prototyping and iterative remodeling, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's step back and let's get the fundamentals here. 
Uh, this is a bit of a primer on what's happening in costing. Uh, I like to use this example. Imagine you go to a restaurant with three other friends. You order a little salad and the other three order the most expensive item on the menu and a glass of wine. And at the end of the meal, when the waiter waitress brings the bill, the other three say, hey, let's split this check evenly. How do you feel? Like, not fair, not equitable. Well, that's how products, and we'll get to channels and customers in a second, but that's how products feel in a general ledger, standard cost accounting system in companies, when the accountants take this big, large blob amount of indirect expense, commonly called overhead, and they peanut butter spread it to all the products using like direct labor input hours or machine hours or number of units produced or sales dollars or head count or square feet, you know, none of those factors reflect the unique consumption that those various products proportionally consumed of the expenses in those end-to-end -end business processes and the work activities that belong to them. So if you were to trace and assign the individual work activities, it may only need 20 or 30 of them, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Um, you'll discover that many of those products were over-costed and some were under-costed because it's a zero-sum error game. So what that means is, although the accounting, financial external accounting reconciles exactly to the penny for the auditors and the regulatory agencies, it's totally off and wrong, uh, distorted internally using management accounting. So the definition of activity-based costing is it's as if the waiter or waitress brings four individual checks. You pay for what you consume. Now, and in a second, I'm going to ask you to go to a slide, but before you do, part of the issue is the standard cost accounting responsibility center statement. You know, every manager has received this. You know what it looks like. It's got, you know, actual budgets, got these salary supply and so forth. You know, that's a good report. But the problem is when managers get that report, they don't really see anything of where it went or what caused their expenses to happen. I always say that when managers see that report, they're either happy or sad, they're rarely any smarter. And so what activity-based costing does is it starts with that report, but it has to change the structure of the format, salary, supply, telephone, travel. That's, that's a ledger expense account. It has to translate it first into the language of work, key scan claims, you know, uh, move parts, uh, heal patient, do blood tests, verb, adjective, noun, and then it reassigns those activity costs to the products like the waiter or waitress in the hospital. So basically, costing is modeling. It's not T accounts and journal entries, which is what accountants, it's taking the inputs, all of the salary, supplies, converting them into the work activities, and then I call it piling up and assigning them to the products. Rich, why don't we go to the first slide? Now, immediately, some of you who are seeing it are like, you know, oh, way too complex. But this is actually not a bad diagram that shows the universal, if you will, description of how any organization's expense structure exists. You've got the resources that are the expenses in the top, and that's collected through payroll systems or purchasing systems. You know, it's basically anytime you spend money on something. Then in the middle, it reassigns them to the work activities. We've got people activities, and then we've got equipment activities. Men and women run machines, machines make parts. Men and women drive buses, buses deliver passengers. So equipment has activities too. And then it piles up in the bottom. You can see there's supplier related expenses. There's the product and standard service lines. Uh, there's the customers I could have put in type of orders, domestic orders. But the point is, once we get all the costs assigned to suppliers, products, or customers, then it's what I call the predator food chain. Some of the, the, the products are actually being consumed by the customers that would come out of a sales register. So basically, it's input equals output. If you had $2 million of January expenses, you'll have exactly $2 million to the penny or euros if this is you know people from overseas of at work activities and it will pile up exactly 2 million into the customers. And then in the top right of the bottom box is something called business sustaining. Um, 
because there will be expenses that have nothing to do with making products or delivering services to customers. So things like the legal department or cutting the lawn or maintaining the building and, or you know, when the accountants close the books each month. Uh, so we create what are called final cost objects like senior management is one or regulatory agencies. And um, because that's a cost of doing business that you have to incur. And so maybe that can be 10 or 20% of a company's expense structure. They still have to recover it. If you look at all of those arrows in that diagram, think of them as thin straws or wide pipes where the diameter reflects the amount of money going through. That's why it will reconcile exactly to the penny or the euro. And now in your mind, reverse the arrows so they're going from the bottom to the top. If you can just do that in your mind. That's what's happening in every organization, every minute, hour, day, week, month, year. The customers and the products are placing demands on the workload. The workload is drawing on the spending or the capacity or the budget and the costs measure the effect in the other direction. And so if you refresh these models, like on a monthly basis, you're actually seeing the actual costs. And, but the point is costing is modeling and that's the message. Now we need to talk about what do you see when you do activity-based costing? And I'll leave that to your next question, Rich. Can you give us some examples of kind of how to use this effectively and, and, and you know, kind of what kinds of decisions would you be able to make based on this kind of information once, it, once you have it? Well, you know, before I answer the uses, we got to reflect on, and I'm not sure what slide you've got, um, but the consequences is you have what are called high maintenance customers and low maintenance customers. So sales volume is not automatically proportionate with profit. And this is really a misconception and it really surprises managers and executives, although it really shouldn't. So for example, high demanding customers, always shifting schedule never always ordering special, never standard, always returning goods, always calling help desk. You know, those are tough and that and all that extra work causes extra cost. Load demanding customers, we love them, only buy standard, never shift schedule, never call help desk, never return goods. So if those two types of customers bought the same volume, same mix at the same price, they're not equally profitable the high maintenance, high demanding customers is less profitable because it's costing you a lot of extra work. And so this is the starting point. When I said earlier that what there has to be a mind shift with the marketing and sales that it's not about just growing sales, it's growing profitable sales. Um, and so they've got to be, have a better understanding. Then comes to once we have the facts, and we go below the gross product profit line. So selling, marketing, distribution, customer service. See, the accountants never trace that. They're not, that's legally, they don't need to. They just do inventory costs. They stop at the gross product profit margin line. But as I said earlier, the bottom half of the picture is more important than the top half. You know, why is that? I already mentioned, you know, customers view suppliers as, uh, as uh, commodities, therefore you need differentiated services for different types of customers. You know, another reason is the internet. The internet is shifting power irreversibly from sellers to buyers. And I don't just mean people listening here and your spouse is doing, you know, shopping on the internet. Today, purchasing agents in companies with a click of a mouse can see 50 suppliers and all their pricing. So we really need to know that bottom half. And that's really what's called the cost to serve. Then the real, now to your question, Rich, once you know where customers are located, and there may be a slide, I can't see them, that's got a grid, the vertical axis should be the profit margin on the products or standard services. The horizontal axis should be the cost to serve from the you know easy to serve, the difficult to serve at the right. And so if you have customers, which are the intersection circles that are in the bottom right of that quadrant, man, they're buying low margin mix from you and they're difficult to serve. You know, they're outright unprofitable. 
The best customers are on the upper left because they're buying high margin mix and they're easy to serve. So now comes to your question, what do you do to move the dots? How do you move the dots from the bottom right to the upper left? And examples would be cross-selling and upselling. You know, if they buy a set of golf clubs, can I sell them a golf shirt? If they buy the golf shirt, can I sell them a second shirt at a discount? Another one is fee-based fee surcharging. You know, just like the um, airlines do with baggage, and now you have to pay for money if you want to be on an aisle seat versus a middle seat. The banks have been doing fee bases for, you know, to number of checks, wire transfers, that kind of stuff. So when you've got high demanding customers are asking for extra services with the activity-based costing, you can actually identify, well, what is the real cost of that extra service? I'm going to charge them the incremental amount. And so, you know, we'll, we'll recover it. Um, you could, at the very extreme, fire the customer, terminate the relationship altogether, you know, uh, but... That's tricky because if you terminate the relationship saying that we'll never be profitable with this customer, effectively the sales volume goes away, but not the expenses. You still have the same number of employees and so forth. So you've effectively freed up unused capacity. So then the question is who owns the unused capacity and what do we do with it? And the owner is not operations. All those process people, lean management, Six Sigma, their whole mission is to basically create efficiencies and keep freeing up unused capacity. The owner is senior management and the sales force. They have two choices, either get rid of the unused capacity or fill it with more profitable business. And we want the latter because we don't want to terminate employees. We want to keep people employed. So it's their job. But anyway, I'm just giving you a few ideas of uh, what people can do. You know, once you have the facts, all sorts of needed conversations can take place. Why is that customer so unprofitable? You can start seeing the driver quantities. Do we do extra work? You know, in the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one, what it comes down to. And usually the biggest opinion wins, which is, you know, the boss of the boss of the boss. So we want visibility and transparency and understanding. Yeah, and all of this makes a lot of sense, and it has not been my experience, except for that last point, which is the loudest voice usually gets what they want, which is not the way to run a business. So this is so logical, it, it sounds like it's really, in many ways, um, straightforward. I won't say simple, but straightforward. What you've written about the fact that you know, the adoption rate of these kinds of processes and calculating customer profitability, et cetera, have not been something that lots of people or the adoption rate has been pretty slow. Why is that? And, you know, what would you, what's the reasons behind it? And probably that gives us a hint about, you know, what we should do differently. Yeah. Yeah, it's very frustrating to me. I, I typically say many of the accountants are back in the 1960s. I, I jokingly say if accountants were scientists, the world would still be flat kind of thing. Um, one of the obstacles is an IT related one, dirty data, low quality information, disparate data sources. You know, we got Dell, IBM, HP equipment in here. But, you know, the, the IT function has been addressing that and solving that, you know, extraction, transform, and load. And so I don't think that's the issue much anymore. Um, another barrier is that perception barrier that it's way too complicated. And I kind of jokingly criticized you earlier when I said that was your experience. A lot of people um, remember the 1990s when ABC sort of kind of came out the shoot. I was very lucky. I got recruited in 1988 to KPMG. They had struck a relationship with Professor Robert S. Kaplan of the Harvard Business School. That name may not mean much to the listeners, although some will say, oh, balance scorecard, strategy map with Kaplan and Norton. But he did the early pioneering work in ABC. And so I got trained by him for five years. I did nothing but implement. And I, I learned that the real technique is to do rapid prototyping with iterative remodeling to right size the model but unfortunately, consultants wanted billable hours, and then accountants have this mentality of precision, five digits to the right decimal point. And so the models were like way over-designed. So an another problem is they failed. They collapsed under their own weight, or six months into it, the executive pulled the plug and said, ah, it's another meaningless financial exercise by the bean counters. So, but we, we can get through that. The rapid prototyping is definitely the way to go. Rich, I think the real issue is behavioral. It's resistance to change. Um, 
which is human nature. You know, it's we don't do that here, or we've done it this way all the time and we've been fine, or we know the answers, they're in our head, uh, or fear of being measured, or fear of being accountable, or fear of other departments knowing the truth. Oh, that product is actually less profitable than we thought, and this other one is. Well, the product manager may not want that to know. So, you know, it's really winds up being a behavioral uh, set of issues that are slowing the adoption rate. We got to get through this because um, shareholders deserve, well, wait, shareholders deserve, if you will, higher profits through their customer, but line managers deserve better, if you will, information from their CFO and the accounting department, and it's not being provided sufficiently now. Just for curiosity, how much of, um, in some senses, are the way we look and measure our business is so driven by kind of regulatory constraints these days that that in a roundabout way becomes such a focus that we're not doing what we really should be doing for, for stockholders, for employees, and that is give us great tools to really understand how to make better decisions. Yeah, yeah. you know, I didn't go through the whole laundry list of, you know, reasons for the slope adoption rate, but you're, on, you're, you're pointing one out. The issue is that um, financial, external financial accounting has been very dominant over internal management accounting, and they're, they're different. So the external is really about, you know, regulatory compliance, SEC, you know, and so forth. And, and there's more problems to it. Um, some of the companies take so long to close the books that even though they may desire to put in the management accounting, which is going to give a different set of numbers. That's another issue because you're going to not have to follow the rules for SEC, like for inventory costing. But, you know, they get to the third week, they close the books, they do the final adjustment or journal entries, they do the variance report for the board of directors, they take a deep breath and the gerbil wheel starts again for the next month cycle. They don't have time. Um, another part of the problem, though, is the universities. You know, a lot of the deans, and they're not going to like this message, they want their students in the accounting school to basically pass their CPA and go to Deloitte and EY and PwC and Grant Thornton and all of the CPA firms, you know, so they're not really preparing them for the internal management accounting. And the truth is, you know, it's up or out when you get into the accounting firms, not, you know, very few actually make it to partners. So many of them spin off and take a job with one of their audit clients. And then they got to basically think management accounting, so they're not prepared. So um, that's part of the story. It's a really an imbalance, and I'm hoping with time that there'll be a rebalancing where management accounting, which I'm, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, provides much more value to decision makers than clearly external reporting. That's, you know, in a low, medium, high, low value is financial reporting. Medium is really just management accounting historically, where the real value is the predictive costing, which we're not talked about, and that will be for a different webinar, you know, rolling financial forecast, what if scenario analysis, make versus buy decisions, you know, what, do, how do you use accounting, management accounting for those decisions? So I want to come back to one other thing you said that I intrigued me, because this seems like, um, and I think the forces, some of the forces involved want to make it really big, costly programs. And you said something about the fact that this could be kind of an iterative, that an iterative approach is appro appropriate and that you need to kind of move forward a little bit at a time. I, can you talk to that just for another minute or two? Yeah, I mean, the IT people are already already familiar with this method. It's called RAD, Rapid Application Development. And, you know, the, the logic there is some types of designing systems are just so complex that you can't do data requirements definition using, you know, a big set of, you know, uh, log books. So, you know, you do it quick and dirty. The way I, I, this is a service I do, I'm partly retired, is, you know, get five, six people in a room, conference room, line managers, functional areas, you build the ABC model really quick, higher level, but, you know, engaging, uh, bring the executive team and peer group in in the afternoon of the second day when it's complete, and uh, all the light bulbs go on. The guys show it to them. Oh, that's what it's going to look like. Then you do iterative remodeling, uh, which means you go a little deeper in different places because it's like sensitivity analysis. And then eventually it's good enough. You know, we have a phrase, it's better to be approximately correct than precisely inaccurate. 
and uh, you don't have to have super precision. You know, what's the data accuracy requirements anyway? Most of the stuff you didn't even know. No, that's exactly right. The fact is you want to know at a macro level whether or not something's at the profitability or above the profitability or comparatively a better profitable. Yeah. You don't care if it's at what percentage or what degree of, yeah. of, of accuracy. That's, that's kind of traditional accounting in terms of roll-up. But it's not not what you need for this. I totally agree. Yeah. Hey, so, Rich, because I'm going to interrupt you because there, this is the business analytics collaborative is analytical people. And they're kind of saying, well, maybe oh, this is this cost accounting. I just want to and you've got a couple of slides. I just want to mention a, a embryonic technique that involves analytics that very few companies are at the level to do. But the few that are have been really amazing. So let me just quickly describe it. There should be a diagram there that I think is a decile diagram. So if you're, after you calculated customer profitability, you can put them into the deciles. So the first decile is the you know, most profitable customers, then the second decile, the next 10% profitable and so forth. Along the way, you get to break even and then at the right side of the guy, where you got unprofitable customers. So now I actually know who's more or less profitable. Now is the question, what differentiates profitable customers, highly profitable from low profitable? Well, you could speculate. Well, maybe the profitable ones are older people and less profitable are younger people. Or maybe the profitable are women and less profitable are males or vice versa. Or maybe it's a gender. Or the point is you can speculate forever. Why not use the computer? Why not use the computer? Because now that you've calculated customer profitability, you have a dependent variable. That profit level depended on other things. I've got a customer master file over here. I've got all sorts of information. What did they buy? When did they buy? How much did they buy? Where do they live? What's their zip code? What's their income level? What's the color of their eyes? For all I know, there could be 300 variables. And now the analytical technique is called recursive partitioning with decision trees. Recursive partitioning with decision trees. Its first calculation is it will go to that customer master file. It'll also look at the customer profitability sequence and it'll say that is the number one differentiator. Could be average order size. It could have been distance from our factory. It could have been whatever. And then it'll go down the tree next level, next level. And if anyone is interested further on this, please send me an email and I will introduce you to a professor that um, I helped write a research paper on this and he can get into it a lot better. It's just an example of now deep analytics being applied to a method. Customer profitability is a great method in and of itself, but when you add analytics to it, they become more powerful. That I think is gonna really make the competitive edge as everybody gets a little more data scientist, you know, advanced analytics, business analytics, you know, then we gotta take it the next step further. Well, that's really helpful. Um, uh, I guess, I guess uh, in, in closing, uh, let me go reference. You mentioned to go to BAC Business Analytics Collaborative. You have a page there. There's more information. You've written things. There's lots of links to your site. So that's a great resource for someone who's interested in there to go to your expert page on Business Analytics Collaborative and they can get a lot more information kind of about this topic and, and by the way, connect with you, et cetera. Any, anything else kind of on this area of profitability? I've, I've kind of circled around the subject kind of from, from why you're an expert all the way through to kind of how this applies to business analytics, collaborative kind of classic member. Anything else that you, you would recommend our, our members to be thinking about um, doing, et cetera? Well, I want to caution that, you know, this management accounting, this measuring that we talked about is not a silver bullet. It, in reality, what it does is it just provides visibility and transparency and cause and effect relationships. And I always like to say, management accounting never answers questions. What it does is it generates questions. And once people start seeing why large sales customers are much less profitable than medium ones, it then begs the question, why? And that's really, I think, what an analytic, analytical community, an analytical person is all about. It's investigation, it's discovery. 
Um, it's hypothesis testing. It's asking why. So um, I, my big message is I wish the CFOs and the accountants up there would basically produce this information because then it'll really create opportunities for the analysts working with the line managers. And it's all in the interest of the shareholders. It is. And I will tell you, I think a lot better decisions could be made <laughs> by everybody in the organization if they had this kind of visibility. So thank you again for being with us, Gary. Um, Ryan, do we have a question or two that have come in? Yeah, there's one question here. And, and uh, as always, before, we, before I, I give that to you, Gary, I want to say that if you're watching this in the future, through the power of the internet, you can, um, and you have a question, or if you're watching it live and you've got a question that, that hits you tomorrow, um, come on into the forums at BA Collaborative. You can submit the question there. And Gary, specifically, go check out Gary Koken's expert page and um, the Gary Koken's forum. There is a great place to submit those questions, or if um, you know, if you want to have a conversation about some of the stuff that we've been talking about today, it's a great place to do it. So um, I'll you with that and uh, and then as far as today so one, one question here um, the the question what's one lesson you'd say has been learned by companies for implementing this type of system and maybe I'll give a little bit of color on that just uh, you, you mentioned some of there's some very clear benefits you've mentioned um, when you can accurately um, segment customers or when you start looking at this data is there anything that has surprised companies hey we implemented this this type of thing, we started looking at customer profitability and then all of a sudden this other synergistic effect happened, anything like that that you've seen? I, I think the surprise is really much more basic. They always think that the largest customer is the most profitable one. And when they see that that big large customer has been so demanding that they may rank, you know, like a third ranking, that's, that's the surprise. When it comes to lessons learned, <clears throat> there's really two levels I wanna, at, at, at one basic level, they, people underestimate resistance to change. And so you gotta really be careful in the beginning to get buy-in. I mean, there will be some managers who really don't want that information to come out. I had a, anecdotally a, an experience with the product manager at a bakery for the Danishes and make a long story short, his product was the most profitable and winds up that all that sugar and jelly caused a lot of extra work and the bread was more profitable. And man, that guy found out that it was going to happen. And he went to the CEO and said, what are we doing this stupid ABC for? We should do TQM. We got kicked out. We were back six months later because it didn't answer the question. Where do we make money? and Where do we lose money? And it's just an example of a man who cared much more about his personal interest than his company as a whole. So don't underestimate, you really need two plans. You need an implementation plan and you need a communication plan. Briefly, the other lesson, and this is embryonic, and it's gonna really surprise some people, you've gotta start shifting the incentive system, compensation system for the sales force from 100% exclusively sales volume to a blend of like 60% sales, 40% profit by customer. And so when the sales director has their account planning meetings with each of the salesperson, looking at their account customer by customer, they ask them, what are you gonna to do to make them more profitable? Not just sell them more, make them more profitable. And I'll tell you what, salespeople, when they, you shift the game about how they're gonna get reward for their purse or their wallet, they figure it out. And they start basically altering the behavior of their customer in harmony with the expense structure. No partial trucks, partial skids, full truck, full skids. And it's good for the shareholders, it's good for the sales force. That's gonna be, if you will, the, the future, but you gotta have the customer profitability information in the first place. So to dovetail into that, Gary, I, I have to ask, with some of the companies that you've worked with um, that have embraced this, um, do you kind of have a sense um, of their bottom line profitability change? Yeah, I don't, you know, there's always this question, what's the ROI on ABC? What's the return on investment? And I always say, well, tell me what the ROI is on your general ledger on, compared to this, I'll, com I'll compare. Um, it's really hard to measure the incremental value of better information, uh, but I will swag it. You know, I think it's gotta be 10 to 20%. I don't think it's immaterial. I think it, it, it is substantial, but I think more importantly, 
the having those that practice a permanent repeatable production system that you're refreshing every month basically protects the sustainability and i don't mean environmental sustainability i mean just the viability of a company going forward i mean it's you know having a bow and arrow versus a club you know or a, you know i want to be i want to be good for the long term well i think that's all that's great and i think this has been a great session um Ryan, as long as we don't have any more questions, I want to say thank you to Gary and thank you for being here again. And I think this is another session that's really going to be beneficial uh, to our members. Thanks for having me, Brian. Brian and, and Rich. Yeah, and uh, so that concludes our live event here today. Uh, we've mentioned a few times this will be available in Gary, the Gary Cokins file library on BAC. And if you have any questions or kind of want to continue the conversation, that's the place to do it. So that wraps up things for today. Have a great week, and we'll see you at the BAC website. Bye.